Payne again. Yeah, Dan. Uh, listen, I noticed that, like, in addition to being sort of dressed up today because we have a feature interview with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, you appear to be wearing a very interesting beaded medallion that, uh, you know, if I'm not mistaken, looks like Bigfoot. Uh, it's sort of Bigfoot. Uh, in our language, uh, Anishinaabe Moan, we call this being Sabe. And she's one of our most important sacred beings in our culture. Oh, really? What does she represent? Okay, so Sabe is, in our creation stories, and long story short, tells basically the story of how intuition came to our community, our culture. Oh, intuition, eh? Like uh, when you know something instinctively? Yeah, so I, so I wore Sabe because I wanted to respond to what the Prime Minister says, like in the moment, like sort of feel out the interview per se. And just sort of as he's responding to our questions, figure out what to say next. Hmm. Uh, okay, that uh, sounds really great. Uh, it, how many pages do you have there, Dan? Uh, how many pages do, of questions did you write out for the Prime Minister? Uh, you know, I, I got lots of pages of questions here. Uh, I'm not using intuition today. I'm just okay, do using, you, do you, you know. have any spiritual beings that help you with intuition? Oh, man, of course not. I'm from Ontario. The Winnipeg Free Press proudly presents, in partnership with CJNU 93.7 FM, Nigan and the Lone Ranger. With your hosts, Nigan Sinclair and Dan Lett. Bonjour, Tanse. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the podcast this week. Uh, we're very honored to be able to bring this very special edition of the pod to you. But it's a crazy time here on Treaty One territory here in Winnipeg. It's like you take all of the events in the Indigenous world and kind of bring them all to Winnipeg at once. There's a trade show. There's a big powwow this weekend. There's a really big literary conference at in at the Forks. There's even a big identity summit. It is really the center of lots of Indigenous things happening in the country right now here in Winnipeg. Well, we warned people who take in this podcast, that we were ground zero <laughs> That's right. for the debate over <laughs> reconciliation. So, you know, believe us or don't believe us, but if you don't believe us, we're bringing the reconciliation home. In one yeah. week, you can see just epic, epic things. And of course, in the the, the Skibiki trial continues to sort of grip the city and interest many people. And certainly we've been covering that all week uh, in the pages of the free press. But uh, there was a little special thing that happened this today here in the city. Uh, the Prime Minister's in town. Yeah, Prime Minister's in town, um, as you're about to hear in greater detail, because he was gracious enough to grant us a short interview. Um, it's a break week in the House of Commons in Ottawa. Break week means barnstorming the country, pan-Canadian traveling. Uh, traveling. Uh, and, you know, seeing the staff of the Prime Minister, you can certainly tell that not only are they a well-oiled machine, but they've clearly been on the road a lot in about 48 hours, 72 hours, yeah. just traveling all over the place. Well, and we only got to see sort of like, you know, the body men, the security guards, the communicators, whatever. There's a whole squad of advanced people who come and they scout out locations and they have security people that make sure that, you know, security's okay. And uh, yeah, and it's um, and it, it, it brings to mind sort of a phenomenon I've seen over my years covering politics, which is, you know, when we're sort of in our natural environment, we're, you know, home with the family or we're at a cocktail party or having lunch with friends and the prime minister comes up in topic, is topic of conversation, um, everybody's got a lot of harsh things to say. I mean, we do. Uh, totally. People I mean, love to hate the prime minister. It's it, especially now. I mean, the, the polls suggest there's some real concerns around the prime minister. We just come out of a pandemic in which uh, I think a lot of people have some strong thoughts and opinions. But then you meet the guy. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, and this isn't sort of a like a an assessment of him as a person per se. But you know what? Like those same people who will say really rotten things. Um, you know, when they meet the prime minister, when you see the prime minister in public, you see that there is still enough respect for the office that people res like are actually happy to see a prime minister out and about barnstorming the country, making announcements and uh, things like that. It is a very unique thing to sit with a prime minister. Uh, we only had a short time to sit. Uh, in fact, he gave us a few extra moments uh, during the feature interview you'll hear about in just a minute. But um, it is a kind of a experiencing the gravitas of the whole experience. Yeah. Uh, we, we were called just a few days ago, uh, offered a spot that we had requested months ago. Dan worked cr 
very creatively all this week to make sure that we get have a studio in the school in which the Prime Minister made the announcement this morning. And then we had to go through layers of security. Uh, we met the vice principal of the school. Uh, we met, of course, all of the different RCMP officers, which are local and also uh, national. Yeah. Um, and then you just kind of sit and you wait and you just yeah. wait for the prime minister to show up. And it's a very surreal kind of experience. Everybody's chatting. But then when he enters, uh, everybody kind of comes to attention. It's a very interesting experience. Yeah. And, and this isn't just uh, for Justin Trudeau. Federal party leaders are good interviews. Um, you know, they are engaging. They're knowledgeable. Uh, you know, uh, like they look you in the eye, like they're pros, right? So, it, you know, you get years and years of polish and experience uh, coming through. So it, it was a very interesting conversation. Um, I'd like to think that uh, we gave him a chance to talk about some of the things he wanted to talk about. I think and we... then I think you, uh, if I could give you, uh, I don't give you props <laughs> often, but I will say that uh, I think he did Manitoba proud today. I think he also did our media colleagues proud. I mean, today we asked questions, I think, that haven't been asked very often of this prime minister. We read, we said right to his face, I think some pretty difficult things to answer. And, uh, and I asked him specifically, how can Indigenous peoples trust you? Yep. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, what is the polls and and even talking, I think he made quite a strong disagreement with you on one of the questions. Yeah, which is, again, like I think, um, especially in a podcast format, you do want a little disagreement. I mean, you know, one of the great flaws in our podcast, Nagan, is that you and I agree about everything. I just disagree <laughs> with you off off <laughs> air. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah, that's right. No, I, I, yeah. we, we've, had, we've had a few uh, clashes here and there. But, yeah. but um, I uh, want to just say that, you know, having this interview, uh, I think, will lead to other interviews. One of the great things about meeting the Prime Minister's staff is that uh, one of the things that they talk to us about is, you know, is there other people you'd like to interview? And so we yeah. have seized on that opportunity. So I think this is a good moment for the pod. I think as the Free Press podcast, I think it's also a good thing for the paper to mm. have, uh, you know, more more dialogue is good dialogue, particularly yep. considering the federal election and other parties who may be listening. You're welcome too. <laughs> well, we have talked to federal NDP leader uh, Yagmeet Singh. He was uh, very gracious. Uh, we have been chasing an interview with... Um, uh, conservative leader Pierre Polyev. And, uh, you know, I would like to think now that we've had the Prime Minister on. The Conservatives can't duck us anymore. They gotta, they gotta play There's ball. No excuse. And we also promised the Prime Minister a T-shirt at the end of this interview. Yeah. So that means we have to get T-shirts now. Eventually, at least we have to. It's, make, the, it's the ever going threat of this podcast that we get T-shirts. It's a limited run of one for the Prime <laughs> Minister. We're gonna get bloody T-shirts. Anyways. Here is our feature interview with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, we talked to him at uh, in a multi-purpose room at Elwick uh, Community School in North Winnipeg, North End of Winnipeg. And uh, here's our interview. We can't tell you how much we appreciate that no, you're coming. Listen, I've, I've always, uh, always looking forward to uh, having good conversations. Yeah, uh, it's so great. I wish we had more time, but of course you, we need to get right into it. And I know that you're uh, very busy, so uh, but just really, really appreciate being in the territory. No, listen, thank you for the welcome, and uh, looking forward to uh, looking forward to getting into it. Okay. Dan usually yeah. does the starts, yeah. so we're going <laughs> to hand over to Dan here. As you are, you ready to go? Yeah, you don't water anything. No, nope, I'm all no. good. James, I'm going to give you a, uh, uh, just a brief countdown in and a pause. Okay. Hi, James. <laughs> in three. Two, one. Uh, we're really uh, sort of blessed today that uh, our podcast schedule and the schedule of the House of Commons happen to coincide. <laughs> the Commons is off this week, and that means that uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is traveling the country, and uh, he's got a variety of messages, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So I'd like to utter the four words that no sitting Prime Minister ever, even 10 years ago, ever thought they would hear. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> what a pleasure to be on, Dan. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's no one message that you're really trying to get out in this sort of week between sitting sessions, housing, school lunches today in Winnipeg. What what's the what, like? What is the strategy? How do you try to take advantage of that week off? Well, I guess the the the, the one message, the big message, overarching everything is. We need to make this country fairer for every generation. Uh, we are seeing right now um, too many young families unable to even imagine buying a home. They're squeezed with uh, the price of groceries. They're uh, worried about you know, 
instability, not just in their communities, but around the world, that everything's changing so fast, that there's a lot of anxiety out there. And I believe, and it's part of my political philosophy, but also my, my conviction as someone who was an educator, worked in you know, various communities for a long time, that it's the role of society and therefore government to be there, to be investing in the right places, supporting the people who need it, and building a better future. So a lot of the things we're announcing today, whether it's the National School Food Program, uh, whether it's uh, more spaces in child care, whether it's talking about the huge impact of our dental care uh, on seniors, like these are things that are helping folks at a time where there are lots of pressure in their lives. So you have had, uh, and forgive me for noticing, a little bit of time to spar with some of the premiers as you go across, uh, Premier Higgs in, in New Brunswick being notable. Is, there, um, is this kind of an opportunity in the backyard of some of the provincial leaders uh, to let them know that you're watching them uh, and, and maybe express those uh, concerns on behalf of the federal government? It's, it's not so much expressing concerns on behalf of the federal government. It's making sure I'm filling my responsibilities as being prime minister for all Canadians. And when uh, women in uh, New Brunswick don't have access to health, safe health and reproductive services, that's something that, yeah, is part of my job looking out for all Canadians. Uh, when I'm dealing uh, with uh, uh, a province like, like Saskatchewan that's uh, not stepping up on the fight against climate change, I'm there to talk about how that's impacting on people across the country uh, and people in that jurisdiction. So for me, my job is partially to make sure uh, that Canadians are being fought for, even if in some cases the provincial governments aren't stepping up. Prime Minister, welcome. Miigwech for coming and bidding again uh, for being in the Treaty 1 territory. Mm, thank you. Uh, your government is the most engaged in history. Uh, I've called you the most progressive government in history in terms of dealing with First Nations issues. You've done a big announcement this morning to uh, really will impact 20% uh, of Manitobans who are First Nations Inuit Métis, but of course all everyone else in this province lives beside, works beside, married to an Indigenous person. And uh, so I think that this government's had a big impact on Manitobans. Uh, and you just look at the track record, C92 in child welfare, C91, mm. uh, Indigenous languages, uh, and then the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, this uh, really remarkable moment following the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, the linchpin, I think, is C15, the Indigenous rights legislation, bringing can Canadian law into concert with that. Uh, the other most I'd arguably... Call, you know, the, the, the linchpin is... is, is so much more than any single piece of legislation, but UNDRIP is, is oh, a for huge sure. part of it. Yeah. I, I mean, that that could be the longest legacy uh, because, but uh, anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, I think they're, they for, debated for years to come about mm -hmm. the impacts of all of these legislation. But C15 yeah. is the is such a big game changer in terms of looking at Canadian law. Um, uh, because it, it talks about the ways in which uh, Canadian law can work with Indigenous rights, which in, for a long time has really worked in opposition with each other. Um, the other most progressive government in history, that most engaged government, is really Paul Martin. Um, but what we saw with Paul Martin is when the first weekend Stephen Harper won that election, cancelled 18 months of con consultation with First Nations Inuit yeah. Métis, uh, cancelled the Kelowna Accord, which then your government picked up. One of the challenges is if your leadership shifts, it could be another liberal person with different interests and uh, goals, or maybe another government from another party. How do we know that the C-15 or any of the other uh, major acts might not just be cancelled on the first weekend? We don't. There's nothing any one government can do that can't be then undone by a next government. That is, that is the nature of our democracy. People get to decide what matters and what carries forward. And that's why citizen engagement in these issues matters so much. Part of why we made reconciliation such a key priority for our government as of 2015 was because Canadians were demanding it. Canadians saw what had been not done over the past decade under Stephen Harper and said, no, 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 no. If we're going to be the country we actually like to pretend we are in our minds or aspire to be, 
we have to fix the broken relationship with Indigenous peoples. We have to make sure that everyone has a real chance to succeed. So we set forth a, a path on doing that. We invested tens of billions of dollars uh, into uh, Indigenous reconciliation, concrete things like more schools, uh, better health care, uh, better services for, for uh, urban Indigenous, like getting out there in, in really tangible ways, ending so many of the boil water advisories and a plan to end them all by the time, uh, uh, as soon as possible anyway. But then also on the other side, you know, fixing long-term treaty challenges, ending negotiations, moving towards self-government. So there's the delivery of immediate services, but there's also the shifting the nature of the relationship. And we've done amazing things over the past 10 years. There's a lot more to do, but one of the most important things for me now is making sure that Canadians see that there's been much done. Because one of the challenges or one of the fears that I have is First of all, recognizing there's lots more to do. I mean, we have to we have to finish the boil water advisories. We have to make uh, Indigenous women and girls safer. We have to uh, make sure we're investing in, in housing even more than the billions we're putting in. Now there's so much more to do. I worry that in this polarized and simplified, aggressively simplified political climate, people will say, you know, we'll hear everyone saying, oh, there's so much more to do. They'll throw up their hands and say, oh, you know what? Well, 10 years of all this investment didn't give anything, didn't make any progress. Why should we even bother? Let's just make sure we're spending on, on things that are going to make a real difference. So part of the story is, and as a progressive, this is a challenge we always have, recognizing that, yes, we've done a lot and there's more to do. But that a lot that we've done, we have to talk about it and elevate it a little bit more as well because Canadians will give up on the idea of ever trying to fix it if it gets hard. And it's going to be hard, but I know Canadians are still deeply committed to reconciliation and I heard it from Indigenous communities right across the country, how much of a difference we've made. I Absolutely. I mean, I can tell you firsthand, I've written, I've written about this for years now, but being personally seeing the Way Show Lake 40, mm -hmm. uh, Freedom Road, mm -hmm. uh, the water treatment plant, I've been there, like I've seen on the real so life. Have I. That was the, and that was the first, first few months of me. Yeah, being there's Prime a big Minister. picture of you up in the community there. Uh, people are very proud and happy about that. Uh, I guess the simple, the direct answer, I know it's probably not fair. I mean, you don't, your job isn't to represent all Canadian governments of all time, but it really is true. Why would First Nations, Inuit, Métis governments trust a federal government if the answer is we don't know if things have been put into place to protect the promises that have been made today uh, on, let's say, C-15, but it could also be Indigenous languages or child welfare and so on. I, I understand, but I mean the alternative is uh, is to just completely disengage and be submitted to whatever government is going to be doing it uh, or not doing it. As Indigenous people step up to you know, get involved in leadership positions, as uh, active participants in in our democratic society, like voting for a federal government, then it becomes more and more difficult for future federal governments to not take into account those concerns and those expectations. But again, the issue of reconciliation isn't just about the uh, Indigenous people and the federal government or any government. It's about all Canadians. We all have to be part of it. And I know that the role that you know, every average, average ordinary non-Indigenous Canadians have to play in reconciliation matters you know, in their workplace, in their, in their community, but also matters at the ballot box in the choices they make. And the more we can be talking about our successes, the more we're clear-eyed about the challenges, and more, the more we get people to actually pronounce on what they intend to do. I mean, right now we have a, an opposition party in the Conservatives who are being very, very careful to not actually have to say anything about reconciliation, anything about investments in Indigenous people. They say, oh, we're going to be cutting programs, we're going to be cutting, uh, you know, cutting the, the, the investments that this Liberal government is making, but we're not going to cut anything that matters to people. Well, you know, that's a very easy answer to say, and it simply doesn't ring true. So um, I'm going to kind of steal one of the major talking points in politics and say, you know, that the only poll that's important is the poll on election day. <laughs> well, thank you for yeah, saying it yeah. yourself so I don't have to. <laughs> no problem. Well, thanks for being here, Prime Minister. We're out of no. uh, But, um, you know, the if you look at the polls right now, you see a rather remarkable 
kind of, you called it the aggressive and sort of simplistic or simple uh, political uh, environment. Um, Nano's poll this week indicated that uh, both yourself and Mr. Polyev are, exist at a historically low level of approval and support. Now, what's odd about that, of course, is that um, Mr. Polyev's party is actually riding uh, very high in the polls right now. So maybe you can talk about that, about A, the way Canadians are seeing political leaders, but also what is it ab about the conservative messaging that would allow them, the party, to thrive while the leader lags behind? It's, we've, it's not like we've never seen it before, but it, it is unusual. I think, I think I'm, I'm going to take a big step back from that, and I don't think it should surprise anyone that Canadians are you know, pretty grumbly right now. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot to be grumpy about, a lot to be frustrated with. Uh, you know, global inflation is hitting us here. I mean, it's it's down from where it was. We're doing better than most countries around the world right now. We're back within the, the targeted range, but food prices are still too high, and people are, are worried about that. Mm -hmm. um, there's still uh, really challenges around housing, and we've got massive investments and builds coming that are going to change that over the coming years, and young people will be able to see once again how they're going to be able to buy a home in the coming years, but we're not there yet. Uh, there are wars going on around in the world in Ukraine that is hitting so many Canadians here in the prairies, uh, in the Middle East that is hitting so many Canadians right across the country uh, on, on both sides of that issue. Like, there is a lot of reasons to feel anxious and frustrated about it. Still continued pan hangover from the pandemic, uh, worries about what way the U.S. is going to go in a few months. All these things leave people in a situation where they're not feeling great about where they are and where we're going. And it's perfectly normal to take that out on politicians in general and whoever happens to be, you know, holding the steering wheel at this particular point, which is me. And I, you know, and that, that is something that I totally understand. The big difference, and people don't get into it, the big difference between what polls say now and what the only poll that matters on election day actually is, is when you ask someone how they're feeling or how they feel about politics right now, they're not actually having to think about it too hard or too long. They're not actually having to make a choice. They know that pressing a button on a keypad or, or giving an answer on the phone isn't going to change anything. And therefore, they don't put too much weight into their surface impressions. They are mm -hmm. telling. It's telling that people are frustrated at all sorts of things. Absolutely. But it's very different once you get into an election campaign. And people are faced with a choice about what kind of future they want, what kind of country they want to be in. Canadians who don't like thinking about politics in general uh, will have to think about politics and think about, okay, what difference is my vote going to make in one direction or another? And that's where an election campaign matters so deeply. Yeah, no pre-election lead for any party uh, can withstand a campaign. It almost always narrows. The, the, Every election yeah. I've been in, I, yeah. I I was you know similarly far back in the polls um, before uh, before the actual election day where I ended up winning. I believe you were third when the election was called. Oh, a, a distant third in actual numbers, not even in the polls. No, no, exactly. uh, but but <laughs> no, we've been we've been down, and it's not to say oh we've been down before you know. It's going to rectify itself. It's not going to, nothing's going to happen automatically. It's going to take the kind of serious work to get Canadians thinking about, okay, what are the choices we get to make in this? You know, do we want to continue with the hard but important work of reconciliation? Do we continue to do everything we can to fight climate change? Do we continue to stand up for women's rights, for, uh, for science, for research? Or do we give in to the kind of, of misinformation, disinformation, divisive feelings that are so easily accessible to everyone anytime we turn on our phones? And that's that's the tension I want to pick up on here. Uh, they, there is a tension. I mean, if you think back to where we were in 2015, uh, there's your famous "It's 2015," and I think resonate resonated at that time. I think it was one of the most popular. It was a global message. I think uh, it also really resonated. Uh, more Indigenous peoples came out to vote for the Liberal Party than any time in history. Um, that's shifted somewhat, and now I think uh, polls suggest that there may be some interest in other parties and in certain Indigenous communities. And and I think my question to you is is how do you find the ten that tension between what the issues that you just you gave a list of very progressive issues 
issues that your government's been very front and center thinking about, talking about, passing legislation about. But then there's this other tension, I think, of what you mentioned with economic issues and this mm -hmm. issue of affordability. And I, uh, I, it'd be fair to say that in many ways, uh, the opposition has been talking a lot, very strongly about that, maybe, maybe in some ways singularly about that. Mm -hmm. um, how do you go into that campaign uh, talking about issues that might not be so popular anymore and might lead to some issues of popularity involving you personally? Well, uh, first of all, let me pick up on, on something you said. I think it would be incredible for Indigenous peoples to get involved with different political parties. I'd love for them all to get involved and vote for, for, for the Liberals, but just having Indigenous people step up to be more politically active on the federal scene means that the concerns and the priorities of Indigenous people become part of what a party needs to do. If, if political parties, the Conservatives are a classic example, know that in a particular riding with a strong Indigenous population, the Indigenous people aren't really going to vote, and it'll be the urban uh, or, the, or the, the suburban or rural farmers who are non-Indigenous who will all come out and vote. Well then they know they don't have to talk about Indigenous issues. If suddenly they know that, no, no, Indigenous people are going to vote in federal elections, then every party has to figure out what to say and what to commit to to do with them in order to earn that vote. So I don't want Indigenous parties, uh, Indigenous people just to come out and vote for me, although, yes, I do. I want them to just commit, first of all, to coming out and vote in large numbers because that's actually what changes did, though, the because directions. Because of the progressive message, right? Yes. And, and coming out of I don't know more. Mm -hmm. And so the, there's a tension, though, right now. There's a deep tension. I mean, we just see, for example, there's this massive spate of violence at grocery, a certain grocery store in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. And that is a poverty issue. That's not a racism issue. Exactly. That's, and because people are really struggling on the streets. And so there's going to be that tension of talking about gender, talking about Indigenous rights. And, and there's also going to be this tension of, like, how much frozen meat costs. Yes. Yeah. No, no. And, and, and I get that, but that's, I mean, that's the parenthesis I wanted to make that oh, sure, it yeah, would be yeah. a great thing for Indigenous people to be truly part of shaping the future of this country. On the economic side, um, what the Conservatives have done a very, very good job of is conflating people's individual anxiety about their own pocketbook issues with uh, a declaration that the Canadian economy is in dire straits, or the Canadian government is in dire straits because we have invested so much either through the pandemic or in dental care or in child care and everything. And that's, that's one of the most sort of pernicious or, or subversive things the Conservative Party has been able to do. Because the Canadian fiscal position of our government is one of the strongest in the world. We have the lowest deficit of any of the advanced industrialized economies. Uh, we have the, the best, uh, uh, lowest debt as a size of the uh, proportion of the size of our economy. We are AAA rated by the international bonds rating agencies that put Canada in the, the third top country in size in the world with the AAA rating after Germany and the United States. We are, we have a very, very strong fiscal position. Some would say in spite of all the investments we've made in child care, in the Canada Child Benefit, in reconciliation, in fighting climate change, I'd say because of those investments we've made that has put more money in the pockets of Canadians, that has lifted hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty, when we talk about reconciliation, when we talk about fighting climate change, when we talk about getting women into the workforce, we're not just talking about social issues. We're talking about the building blocks of a strong economy. And that is actually the heart of the di di difference between between our approach as progressives and the conservatives approach which is no 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 the government should do less should spend less should improve on its already top of class fiscal balance and not be investing in communities not be investing in dental care or in school foods or in the kinds of things that actually lead to real economic growth from the bottom up and the middle out so the question actually isn't oh is this government spending too much because the answer is according to all the experts around the world no we're not spending too much. We're totally sustainable and responsible in our fiscal plan. So the question becomes, given a responsible fiscal position by the government, do we, A, invest in our communities, invest in vulnerable people, invest in the future to create even better and more inclusive growth in the future? Or B, like the conservatives want, do we 
cut those programs and services and investments in a green economy and investments uh, in fairness and you know put more money in our collective mattress to sit on for a rainy day well, i don't know if the conservatives have looked outside it's raining we're facing a global crisis that is landing on families really hard and we need to be investing in housing we need to be investing in good jobs that's the choice canadians get to make in the next economy in the next election but basing it on facts like canada has the strongest economic uh, position of any of the G7 countries uh, is, well, it's debatable with the U.S. because they're growing so fast, but in terms of debt, in terms of, of responsibilities for future generations, Canada's way better off. So um, it's inevitable that when a party and a leader are uh, lagging in the polls, when there's some uh, disapproval in, uh, through that medium, that there will be talk about how long the leader is going to stay in the party. It's just it's table stakes for the game that we're all in. Um, uh, former Premier Gary Dewar once told me, and it was right around the time that he suddenly left politics, he said, um, sitting first ministers, leaders, need to always have a plan. They need to know mm. how they can go out with their boots on. So uh, the conditions... I disagree. Well, uh, I'll, I'll just give you the rest of the end. Uh -huh. he, he said that the conditions under which you would be, any leader would be willing to step aside, would be either positive things, like you mm -hmm. want to go out when your government, your your jurisdiction's on a high, or the downside when, you know, clearly uh, in some instances a, a leader may be a drag on the party, on a governing party. So m my question is, you've already answered part of it, which is you disagree yeah, with, the, with the sentiment. So I'm going to let you tell, tell me why you disagree. Well, first of all, I have a huge respect for Gary. He's a, he's a consummate professional, a really thoughtful, a thoughtful person and, and a great leader. Um, but I spend no time thinking about how I'm going to leave this job or what conditions I might leave this job. And I think as soon as someone, whether you're two years in or 20 years in, starts thinking about their exit strategy, um, yeah, it's time to go. Right now, I am focused on doing the work. I am focused on the challenges Canadians are facing and how to actually solve for them. Uh, I'm not thinking about, oh, you know, am I going to get a corner office in a law firm once I'm done this? Are people going to like me or not? Listen, I'm doing this job. to try, and I got into politics to try and make a difference in real ways and make this country better and stronger and create opportunities for people. Right now, the pressures, the challenges from around the world, but also internally of a very real choice that I think would be hurting Canadians to, to, to go backwards on so many of the things that we've fought for as a country over the past decades, let alone what we've done over the past years. So, so my focus is, is it's time for someone to leave when they find themselves not inspired by the job, not excited about the work they get to do, not uh, focused on the plan to govern the plan to do good things. If you're focused on a plan on how to leave, then yeah, you need to get out of there. Do, do leaders, part of the responsibility of a leader though, to recognize when you may be the issue and not necessarily the party or the government, mm -hmm. is, is that not part of your obligation as a leader? Oh, it, it's essential for a leader uh, to know uh, how people are feeling, to know what they want, know what they need, and understand if they themselves personally are a barrier to getting the things done that matter for Canada yeah. uh, for the future. Uh, in every conversation I have with Canadians, whether where I, I mean, regardless of the, the people waving nasty flags out in, out in front of my events, the actual exchanges I have with people about their hopes, their dreams for the country, Canadians aren't that different or aren't any different than we were, you know, 10 years ago. People are still hopeful and optimistic for the future and want to see a positive vision of us being there for each other, leaning on each other, doing the right kinds of things. And, and the, the interactions I have with Canadians continue to be incredibly positive. Of course, I need to be very aware of my capacity to actually deliver things. Um, but right now, I know that there are so many big things to deliver that we are busy working on every day. I'm not thinking about what if one day. I'm focused on today and tomorrow. 
Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, it is very nice to have you on the pod here at the Negon Long Ranger podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I wanted podcast. to get into it. Uh, tell me about that. Uh, uh, tell me about if you that. you have an extra minute, we'd be happy <laughs> yeah, to gonna, tell you. No, we're going to have your staff roll the, the, the tape on our very first episode. That, we actually talked about that yeah. on our very first yeah, episode. We, it's a background. play. And yeah. of course, you know, if you see the, the long history of the Lone Ranger in Tonto, we're reversing that, you know, I, and talking I, about I who, has the name of the, who has the name of the pod here. And most importantly at the free press we're constantly engaged in thinking about ways that we can make this province better and yeah. um and talking about it i uh, can't tell you how much we appreciate <laughs> you coming to manitoba and uh, to treaty one territory and uh, of course the homeland of the red river metis and uh, and coming over here i can tell you the community really appreciates it we all day we've been hearing here at elwick school uh the uh, talk about the new program and and appreciate that you've spent time in the community um miigwech and uh and come back and if we if you do come back there is a promise that we have t-shirts one day yeah we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna get look t-shirts. forward to trying absolutely <laughs> yeah. but thank you thank you for what you guys are doing listen so much of politics is done in such short sound bites now that being able to have real conversations about where we're going about how we're doing about what what's underpinning the decisions we make uh is i think really really powerful at a time where democracy is under threat. So what you are doing, what Winnipeg Free Press has always done, but what you, you two specifically are doing here, but also in your in your lives as journalists, really matters. So keep that up as well. Thank you very much. Miigwech. Chi miigwech. So that was, I would have to say, objectively, a very fun interview for me. I'm not talking about whether I enjoyed his company. His company was fine. The Prime Minister was very gracious and engaging but i'm just saying gave I, us extra time even yep. you know like uh i don't think a lot of people would understand that when you have an interview with the prime minister what happens is the staff comes in just beforehand and says you have this amount of time and that's it and once i give you the hand signal we are out of here yep. and that didn't happen uh the prime minister just kept going and uh, you know we talked a little bit of, even about the name of the podcast at the end yeah and i think uh the prime minister is very gracious with his time um yeah i i mean i think uh, I think it actually proves that no matter how much time a politician's staff tells us we have, the politicians come in and they have such a good time they stay longer. And this has been a consistent <laughs> the ongoing feature. Theme That's in our right. Podcast. Is that they always overshoot uh, the the deadline? Uh, no, I mean I think we actually uh, everything worked to our favor. Usually, uh, when the prime minister is traveling. His schedule uh, is like they give you an, a, a daily itinerary, and you almost always overshoot the runway. Like you, you never get. This time we actually started seven minutes early, so I think that's what got yeah, us. That the probably extra helped time. us a little bit. I, but you know, didn't give him an easy ride. I'll tell you that. You know, like I, I really wanted to ask him about BLC fifteen, and I think what oftentimes. Uh, I like that he challenged whether that was the most important legislation they passed. I think everybody says so tell, and C-15, Bill C-15 yeah. is is the uh, law that uh, the, uh, was passed by the, the Liberal government to ensure that Canadian federal law, which for years has uh, trampled on Indigenous rights, yeah. uh, e- erased Indigenous rights, has ignored it. Um, you know, saying things like uh, the Indigenous people should not be um, involved in, let's say, governance of the country. And so the United Nations Declaration says that Indigenous peoples have to be involved inherently in the decisions that impact them. And so uh, bringing Canadian law into concert mm-hmm. with the United Nations Declaration, 46 articles, uh, and challenging the Prime Minister to say, how do we know this is not just going to be cancelled by another federal Liberal leader or another political party? And uh, and. It, he was surprisingly blunt. He says, we can't. Yeah. And I asked then, well, why would we ever trust you? Why would First Nations, Inuit, Métis leaders ever trust you? And he says, just get involved. Just get yeah. involved. And and so I, I'm a little uncomfortable with the answer because uh, I wanted to go more into it, but we had lots more other things to say. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think his answer, though, uh, right off the bat, which is, you know, it's part of democracy that there's almost nothing – that any government does that cannot be undone. And that, and that is consistent, uh, you know, whoever, whichever party controls uh, the House of Commons gets to dictate uh, the legislative uh, uh, agenda for the nation. And, um, you know, I mean, I think the ebb and flow of that can be frustrating. It, I mean, it's particularly... But it's also inherently going to create suspicion like why would any first nations then entering into negotiation over anything 
then therefore trust a federal government that could then just simply have a law. Yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. and I, I mean, I think that that uh, that is for indigenous people, it's a much more acute issue than for the rest of us. Uh, oh, car- carbon tax, and the next guy comes in, and there's no carbon tax, and then another guy gets elected, and, and there's, you know, for carbon sure, tax. Yeah. So, yeah. like, that is not the same as uh, fundamentally, like, wiping the slate clean on federal legislation and legal precedent, you know, acknowledging the legal force and... and relationship. Uh, relationship, and, yeah. you know, and... and uh, no, I mean, I think it's... I mean, I do think that, um, you know, the, sh- the sheer numbers I- indicate that Indigenous people in an urban or a remote environment could have such a profound impact on the outcome of an election that, notwithstanding the poll results right now, I think is going to be pretty tight uh, near the end. And, like, the ability, like, honestly, 500 votes here and 500 votes there within a single uh, electoral district can flip a seat, can hold a seat. So, I mean, you know? on one level, that's a really good message. I also think, uh, and my discomfort, I think, is that um, not, I think, with this prime minister, because as I mentioned in the interview, uh, there's been no more engaged government in Indigenous issues than this government. Uh, but the reality is, is that it is kind of a, um, it's a gap in federal law that, uh, when Indigenous peoples work with the federal government that they may not always, they may want to be careful or what it is promised or have assurances that are made. And I think pushing that in the area certainly got in the Prime Minister's head. You talked about things that are, uh, I think, might hit on some soft spots uh, when it comes to polls and when it comes to the way, the favorability of the Prime Minister. And uh, I, mean, I mean, man, like that's a I, I, to, to ask somebody to their face, why do you think that Canadians might find you unpopular is, uh, I mean, that's I think what journalism is all about. Like it was a bit yeah. of a masterclass for me. I mean, to fortunately, watch I was a little more elegant in, in, the, <laughs> <laughs> in the way I approached it. But no, I mean, I think that like, honestly, here in Manitoba, you know, we have two recent examples of uh, the dynamic that exists between a leader, his or her party, and, and government, if they happen to be a governing party. So we've seen um, uh, premiers, uh, Greg Selinger, Brian Pallister, and um, Heather Stephenson all run into this issue of a lack of personal popularity that may or may not be a drag on the popularity of the government. And, you know, when do leaders... Or do leaders ever acknowledge that there are times when it just can't be them anymore? Like they, they, they are, you know, like I, I'm not sure if Greg Selinger had left or and Teresa Oswald had become uh, premier uh, back in 2015, 2016. Would that have changed the outcome of the 2016 election? Maybe. Brian Pallister was elected premier in 2016. He was always less popular than his government. His government, you know, did quite well in the elections. His personal popularity was, you know, quite low. And then, you know, sort of in the middle of the pandemic, which was like a total shit show here in Manitoba, you know, basically the party rose up and and he wasn't ready to go. He would not have gone voluntarily. So they pushed him. Uh, You know, Heather Stephenson came in and proved that she was no tonic uh, for the Conservative Party. Right now, you know, it, it, it does make you wonder, um, you know, and there was a very, it was a very interesting discussion. I, I called for, forth the ghosts of, of Gary Dewar in the, <laughs> in the conversation. Oh, but he's still alive. Yeah, okay. but there was an Annis poll that came out this week, and it showed that um, both Pierre Polyev of the Conservative Party and Justin Trudeau of the Liberals are at historically low levels of personal approval. And despite that, the Conservative Party is actually doing quite well in vote, uh, voter intention uh, uh, polls. And I, I asked him to discuss, like, what does that say about the, the, you know, the electorate? And the answer, I mean, the answer has been both we've seen on television, but we heard today 
the conservatives are touching upon issues that, uh, and then not flushing, not making promises, not uh, committing to ideas. Not pronouncing their own, I thought that was an interesting word. Absolutely. And the, uh, if we were looking for, you know, every interview kind of looks for this kind of wedge moment. Like what is something we could identify to readers, to listeners, to see what is the difference between these parties and, and how can we most distinctly see it? Uh, that might be where we see the most illumination in this interview is that uh, the Prime Minister said that we're going to continue on this progressive agenda and that is what makes us economically viable mm -hmm. in the country. And uh, I think that that is a distinctly different message than what the Conservatives, even though they don't have a track record to speak of or a policy platform to speak of, um, they have been talking about cutting, they have been talking about reduction and re rerouting funds or, or what they say, get out of the way of, of things, you know, whether it be First Nations issues or whether it be gender equity issues or, or the notwithstanding clause, notwithstanding you know. clause of, of exactly, uh, even, even though, uh, the big talk around, um, parental rights and things like that, uh, so that is really inter interesting thing that comes out of this interview is that there's a real distinct, I think there's a distinct different approach in that this federal election, and we heard lots of talk about it in the Prime Minister's words, is really going to also be, or probably centrally be, about is progressivism or engaging of what's often called social justice issues, is that economically beneficial for the country? Yeah. Or is uh, reduction, uh, cutting... Um, tax cuts and so on. Yeah, will that be what will cure this affordability crisis? I think that's, that's a pretty distinct vision that we got. Well, you know, and I, I mean, and the, the prime, like when he talked about his own um, low approval popularity, he did say, and it is true, the com country is grumpy right now. Like, you know, yeah. it's, you know, high interest <laughs> I believe rate, he said grumbly. Grumbly, <laughs> yeah. Like, we'll go with that, grumbly. Uh, but, you know, uh, high interest rates... Uh, high inflation, um, certain degree of economic uncertainty, housing affordability is a, a, a huge issue right now, um, especially for younger generations who thought they were in a position would be in a position to maybe buy a house by by now. Um, so yeah, there's like there are a lot of reasons for people across the political spectrum to be upset. It is, and he did mention, you know, like when you're in government, you've got a record. And people will react to that record. And when you're competing against an, an opposition party where they've got lots of criticism, but they haven't actually said a whole lot about what they want to do, it, it's kind of it's kind of an unfair fight to some extent. L like, OK, so it, it, the prime minister would like his government to be labeled as progressive. And I think you can look at a lot of their policies and you that's probably a, a fair topic. But it's important to know that while he and I'm sure he doesn't totally see it this way, but you know, this is a, it's a difference between, you know, traditional uh, right wing, fiscally conservative austerity and progressivism. And but that's not what it is because Trudeau's also fighting on another front, which is he may be the most aggressive in the current debate on climate change, but a lot of the people who are very passionate about climate change, they resent the fact that he hasn't done more. Uh, even in, on indigenous issues. He yeah. has oh, done a lot, yep. but there are still many people who genuinely, and and it's totally with justification, believe he hasn't done more. Uh, so it, it is, when you are in government, you get it from both sides. And the, the tactic of the opposition parties, which is to throw all of these criticisms, I mean, like according to the conservatives, this just this week alone, the Trudeau government is responsible for the increase in auto thefts. The Trudeau government is... Massive yeah, drug overdoses. Yeah, <laughs> like it's, you know, but this is the liberal policies, fiscal policies and legislation are responsible for these things. Okay, so for the record, Mr. Polyev, because I know that if we talk, start talking directly to you, you will have no choice <laughs> but to but come, come on, on the, the podcast. podcast. <laughs> but, you know, the, in, the increase, the recent rash of auto thefts is not due to a criminal justice issue. They're trying to uh, tie it to, you know, conditional sentencing and things like that. No, it's because the technology used by thieves has exceeded the technology that the auto industry was using uh, on, on immobilizers to stop the thief. So at one time, immobilizers, the technology was out in front of the thieves. 
Now the thieves are back in front. And the auto companies didn't evolve the technology. They didn't introduce new generations of technology. And that's what it's all about. So here's the thing I'm really worried about. And, I, and I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about it. If you say it long enough, people begin to believe it. So there was a poll in the United States. It was in a, uh, a, a so-called swing state and it um, uh, on abortion. And 20% of the respondents said that Democratic President Joe Biden, he was the one responsible for the uh, rollback of Roe v. Wade. And the, <laughs> and the yeah, so they, they blamed it on a Democratic president and not on the Republican appointed Supreme Court, which and the Republican states, which have basically made abortion illegal. So if, if there's that level of ignorance on key issues, kind of like the people who said, like in Saskatchewan, everybody gets some form of carbon tax rebate. But there were people on the news from Saskatchewan saying, yeah, I don't get it. So like, but how do you like, so how do you, how do you level the playing field on, on fact? Well, the prime minister actually talked about this and said that uh, making an issue so that people do care that they're interested in, um, it, that's a tall order. And it's a tall order, I think, for people who frankly are in situations of dire need. And uh, just as a back response, I mean, they're, one of the issues of car theft is that poverty is also on the rise as well. And so, so certainly there's, there's room to, to, um, to, you can connect talk to government about what policy. people's yeah. real life yeah. uh, kitchen table uh, use all the metaphors you want uh, right in front of them kind of situations like hand to mouth uh, these are situ- the reality is is that people are far more interested in where is my groceries coming from how can i afford that yeah. and then perhaps the debate on wednesday in question period in ottawa yeah, so uh, to me, and I, I will say, you could probably tell, I was really, really, really looking forward to do like summoning the ghost of Gary Dewar. Uh, <laughs> you did the, have a, lo- a big smile on your face. Yeah, so, you know, Gary Dewar uh, left provincial politics after a decade, uh, rather suddenly and surprisingly, after a decade, uh, well, actually almost 12 years as Manitoba Premier, three election wins, he left, and... Um, he said to me at the time in, in, a, in an interview, you know, like one of the obligations of, of political leaders is to always be able to recognize when it's time to go so that you can go out with your boots on. So that And this for, led to yeah. the fundamental disagreement the prime minister had with yeah. you. He said, Man, he he jumped said right on me. I am ne- I even d- he sort of interrupted okay, you. So that, yeah, so that the question was like that, you know, should political leaders in their mind, how, can they imagine the conditions under which they would agree to step aside? And He's like, he said, he interrupted me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I don't have a plan to leave. And on top of that, I don't think about that ever. And so and well, then you, he, he you actually, came in and said, yeah. uh, isn't it the responsibility to think a little bit about when uh, the yeah. impact of that maybe popularity or not, or uh, that you may be leaving might have on the party? And uh, again, he just doubled down and said, I'm not thinking at all about this. I'm thinking about use terms like working and all my whole focus yeah. is on this job. He, and- he did agree that it is one of the obligations of political leadership to know, like to see if you are a drag on your party or government. He did say that. But yeah, his other and you know what? Like it wasn't the answer I was expecting, but it's like he said, if I spend too much time thinking about my exit strategy, then I should go. I don't have time to think about my. Oh, I strategy. wanted to bring up the long walk in the snow. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to bring it up so bad. I didn't want to interrupt you. And plus, at that point, the staff was waving at us, literally, yeah. <laughs> literally so, going, "Oh, well, you we're know, way past time, and we have to wrap up." Well, maybe through the magic of audio editing, we can, you know, no, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. <laughs> uh, we'll add the snow. <laughs> walk through the snow. Yeah, actually, you know, just as a side, I, I did, I almost thought about telling a story because I actually, dating myself now, uh, I was in journalism school uh, for the last year of uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau's. Which who is the person who uh, was, for those people who don't know the famous story, uh, said, reporters asked him, you know, you're very unpopular and, you know, you're impacting, this is impacting your government. And he says, I'm going to take a long walk in the snow and then came back from that walk and then promptly resigned from government. So... One of the first times I was ever on Parliament Hill, uh, we had press credentials uh, from Carleton University Journalism School. 
and uh, I had no idea what to do. I was just kind of wandering around the center block, like trying to not look like an idiot. And anyways, then I saw a bunch of photographers queued up. Uh, at the second floor is the prime minister's private offices, the PMO private offices. Now, Langevin block across the street is the prime minister's office. That's the major, you know, where the major staff are or the most staff. But they also have private offices in the center block. So there's a whole bunch of photographers queued up there. And so I just kind of joined in <laughs> with the pack of photographers. And they went in and I just walked right into one of the little anti-offices they have there. And um, Trudeau Sr., uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, was meeting with a foreign diplomat of some sort. And uh, he, they were standing there and they kind of stand there stiff and whatever. And, you know, the photographers are taking pictures. And then he whispered to this diplomat or, or ambassador or whatever, do you want to see me decide what photo is on the front page of every newspaper in the country? And the guy looked at him like, what? And then um, Trudeau Sr. leaned down and tied up his shoe. Boom, 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 Like the flashes went off and the cameras went nuts, right? Uh, I mean, I can't honestly remember if that was actually the photo that was in the newspaper the next day. But, um, you know, uh, Trudeau Sr. Uh, was an in, like a, just a force of nature. Uh, the closest I can say is Brian Mulrooney. When Brian Mulrooney moved through a crowd or, or approached a scrum or whatever, it was intimidating. Uh, with Mulroy, it was intimidating. With uh, I, I wouldn't say that that Justin Trudeau was intimidating. Oh no, I, and, and, and to the PMO stuff, I don't mean that as a criticism. But no, uh, I mean interestingly, I mean he came in by himself, left by himself. Mm -hmm. The staff was around, of course, and and I think that that's. I mean, that's an interesting image too. It's uh, and uh, above all politics, above all different opinions, and certainly there's many other questions I wanted to talk about. You know, purchasing a pipeline. I wanted to talk about uh, the situation of the Wet'suwet'en or the different in, uh, instances of Indigenous rights. Searching that continue the landfill. We, didn't, uh, we, did, we really didn't talk about the real big pressing issue here in Manitoba yeah. with the Skibiki trial, although he did mention it very briefly. Yeah. But, but uh, it was. It's. I'm very appreciative that he would come on the Free Press podcast, and and uh, I think he was too. I think he said that the venues where there's longer conversation is what he wants to spend more time doing, and uh, and I I appreciated that we were one of those places here in Manitoba. Well, and and as we kind of wrap up this episode, uh, I will repeat once again because I know that in the leader of the opposition's office, they are listening to our podcast <laughs> all the time. So I just want to say, Mr. Poliev. You are most welcome. Alongside At all other time. federal leaders. Yeah, we'll uh, even that's take, right. we'll take everybody. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think if we, if we get Pierre Polyev, we are a heartbeat away from getting Will Arnett. So <laughs> who is, he's the great, you have to go back great to white whale. Listen to season one if you want to know what Dan just yeah. referenced there. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you everybody for tuning in this week. Uh, please do. Nigan and I are both, uh, for better, for worse, guys who post their free press emails uh, online and in print. Uh, thank you to trolls of all political we orientations. We hearing from everybody. Yeah. And, uh, but let us know what you think of the interview for sure. We did have a, there was one funny moment today when we were walking up to the, <laughs> uh, to the school. There was a huge group of people and we were recognized as sort of the duo. I thought yeah. it was fun. I thought it was fun. Yeah, people and had listened to the pod and thanks to everybody who listened. I believe the question was, are, were you the podcast guys? And that and, is, yeah. we've never been referred to as a duo before. Yeah. So there to, you go. To quote the uh, amazing Steve Martin, things are going to start happening for us now. <laughs> <laughs> Miigwech to everybody at the Free Press. Miigwech to everybody who uh, supports us. And particularly to our, uh, our in absentia producer, Adam Glynn. And, who, and the, our pinch hitter, Dan Mitchell. Who's Thank coming you, from brother. CJNU, where he's uh, waving to us right now. Thanks for doing all the editing on the fly, and particularly in the last minute to come in. Adam right now is uh, off on uh, a family trip. And yep. uh, and so just thanks for doing all that work. And a big miigwech to all of you for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Miigwech.